Miss Shigato Das. Um, I'm the director of Partnering at Bio, and it is my pleasure to uh, have this panel together today to really help people um, refine their investor pitch. And in my dealings, I've had a lot of questions, uh, a lot of comments looking through the partnering system at Bio. Uh, there are a lot of uh, messages to try to secure investor meetings. So it occurred to me that it would really be fantastic to really have some pros uh, inform everyone on you know how how best to pitch to investors because it's it's certainly a, a very important uh, and sometimes life-changing topic. So um, we have uh, some very uh, esteemed panelists with us today: uh, David Collier, um, MD, Managing Director at CMEA Capital and CEO at Velocity Pharmaceutical Development. Uh, Joe Sum, a partner and analyst at Echo R1 Capital. Uh, Adam Cutler, Managing Director at the Trout Group. And Tony Tontat, Business Analyst, uh, Capital Access Advisors, uh, Boston. So uh, please welcome uh, our panelists today. Uh, we're just going through one or two uh, sound checks to make sure everything's fine. Um, David, how, how are you doing? Can, can you uh, hear everything okay? I'm on the phone now. Uh, I can hear you guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So I just did a quick round of interviews for, uh, excuse me, not interviews, quick round of introductions for everyone. Um, and uh, we'll get under, we'll uh, get started. So again, uh, if um, maybe if each of the panelists, uh, starting me with David uh, Collier, can do just a, a one-minute um, bio on yourself, that that would be a great starting point, and then we'll get right into the, some of the topics and questions. So, David. Hi, everybody. I'm David Collier. I am a managing director at CMEA Capital, and I'm also CEO of Velocity Pharmaceutical Development. Um, I've been at CMEA since 2001. Uh, before that, I was at uh, Burl and Company and helped set up the uh, venture capital business there. So I've been a biotech VC since about 1998, um, which is getting to be quite a long time. Um, so I certainly have a lot of experience from the perspective of a VC hearing lots and lots of uh, investor pitches. Um, so happy to answer questions about uh, what works and what doesn't when you're pitching to VCs. Um, more recently, I've been uh, spending quite a bit of my time running Velocity Pharmaceutical Development, uh, which is a uh, portfolio company of our current fund at CMEA. Uh, the idea at Velocity is uh, not to fund companies, but rather to fund individual drug projects through to clinical proof of concept and uh, try to sell them to pharma companies once we've achieved positive uh, phase two results. So that's been running for about three years. Uh, we currently have four projects underway, and the first is uh, getting close to a clinical readout around the end of the year. Great. Well, congratulations uh, on that, David. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll, we'll jump to uh, Joe. Joe, a brief uh, intro on yourself. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Joe Sum. I'm a partner and analyst at Igor One Capital. We are a biotech dedicated investment fund um, founded a year and a half ago. Um, prior to joining EGAR1, I was at First Manhattan um, helping to manage a biotech investment fund there. Uh, First Manhattan is a generalist asset management firm um, offering different products, including a biotech fund. And uh, prior to that, I was an analyst at Biotech Value Fund, um, which is another biotech investment fund located here in San Francisco. So I've been predominantly public market um, investing in biotech companies for about eight years. Um, we do do private investments as well, although that is a smaller part of our business. Great, thank you. And uh, Adam, let's let's uh, go to you next. Great, thanks. Hi, I'm Adam Cutler. I'm a managing director at the Trout Group. Um, I've been at Trout for uh, over two years, and prior to that, I was a biotechnology equity research analyst for 12 years at a number of investment banks, most recently Credit Suisse. Um, and the Trout Group is um, primarily an investor relations consulting firm. So we work with about 70 life sciences companies, helping them with their uh, 
um, investor relations strategy, uh, as well as with helping generate awareness and interest in the investor and analyst community. Um, and we also have an affiliate uh, arm called Trout Capital, which is a licensed broker dealer um, that allows us to do some investment banking work with companies as well. Great. And finally, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Tony. Take it away. Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Tony Tontat. I had uh, worked at HSBC Investment Banking uh, a few years at SAC Capital Advisors and then on to North Sound Capital. Uh, and all of the time, I have worked in healthcare for the last 15 years. In the last three years in particular, I work as a consultant to uh, the companies, to the family offices that invest in these companies in healthcare, and also directly for VCs. My job is to parachute into a company and craft a message, a story around the technology so it looks more like a business and less like a science project. I have about 40 companies I work with actively. Three of them are public, the rest are private. Great, well I, I hope that that parachute always comes out when you're when you're parachuting in. No, no hard landings hopefully. Yes, thank you. So, so um, and, and Tony is joining us from, from France no less. Uh, so thanks for uh, taking your evening. Thank you. Um, so let, let's just uh, jump right into it. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll pose this to uh, uh, David and Joe first and then uh, hear from um, Adam and Tony. And, and again, this is a very free form forum. Feel free to just speak up whenever you have something to say. No need to wait for me to uh, go to you in particular. Uh, but what are the two to three most important things um, you look for in a presentation, especially in a preclinical company? And um, if you could maybe elaborate that for uh, the different venues, in other words, a company presentation or a 30-minute partnering meeting um, or, or a non-confidential deck versus just a two-minute elevator pitch. What, what are the two or three most important things you look for when you're hearing a pitch? I'm happy to start. Um, I think the by far the most important thing that uh, I look for as an investor uh, is the answer to the question of uh, how how much money do you need, uh, how much time, what milestones are you going to achieve with that, and that all goes to the question of uh, how am I going to get a return on the money that I put in. Um, so I need to understand uh, what the funding that you're requesting, what milestones that's going to allow you to achieve um, so that then I can think about uh, how much value is that adding to the company, how much value is that adding to my investment. Um, because I think, especially if you're talking about something preclinical, um, the trap that investors want to avoid falling into is investing in a company, uh, taking the risk at an early stage, um, being involved for the first one to three years and then having to go out and raise another round of funding um, and if you're successful uh, raising that funding at a, a flat round the same price that you paid so you could have just waited three years and, and come in later so the real question is what you know what's the value inflection point that you're going to achieve and why is that going to allow us then to go raise money at a much higher value for the company or to sell the company at that point great and uh, Joe yeah. what about what about your perspective I I'd certainly agree with everything that David said in terms of anticipate milestones and, and where capital can get you. Um, so that's on the forward-looking side. I would also say that I, I look very hard on the backwards-looking side as to what the genesis of the company was and how did the company get to its current point in time. Because the one thing we all know about a business plan is that it's absolutely not going to unfold this way. And there are lessons that are going to be learned along the way and it's great to know how the company has has developed its science and has learned um, from from its past and how it got to where it is today. And that kind of ties into um, a third thing that we look at is the um, the quality of the management team. And it's very informative um, to understand how the company has um, gone about its business in the past. Um, and and you know the people behind those decisions. And um, so. Just building on to what David said, those those are probably the two or three things that, that we focus on. 
And, and great. I, I know you guys have probably addressed some of the, the big issues, but Adam and Tony, what, what do you advise your clients on in, in this respect? What, what are the two or three most important things they really need to, to emphasize? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we heard a lot of them from David and Joe. I mean, a couple of the things I would just add in terms of detail are, you know, the, the, what is the company's edge? Is it based on certain, having locked up certain intellectual property? Is it a, a certain scientific expertise? Um, is it having made the most headway on a new target? Um, so, you know, what is special about this company? Um, and then, you know, on a related note about any given uh, product candidate, even if it's preclinical, you know, what what is their working hypothesis for why this is going to be an advance and why it's going to be different, um, why that product has the has the potential to make a big impact or be differentiated from other products that might be on the market or in development. Yeah. So so guys, I'll, I'll add on to what um, the very, very good comments coming from the rest of the guys already. I tend to focus on trying to show the company my clients how to make the science look more like a business. So for example, a business would always have to say, what happened if this lead program goes bust? What is the backup? Second of all, if there is a failure of the first program, what is the salvage value of this molecule altogether? Is it greater than zero? What is that number? Right? And then uh, more importantly, I think the companies, especially the, the very, very early stage ones I work with, they tend to underraise, just like what uh, David has said. They, if they needed uh, ten million dollars, they would gladly take two, and then and then see if they can show some kind of milestone and do the rest of the race in order to minimize dilution. But it is truly a devastating bad call for these companies when they don't raise enough and they come back to the capital market again. So what David said is just really dead on. Most of them tend to underrate right when they critically really need to, you know, raise the full amount if they can. Well it sounds like there are a myriad of different uh, aspects uh, that you that you just gave our audience to chew on. Um, let's jump to something uh, important but uh, maybe a little more mundane. Um, it's kind of the eternal question of presentations what is the right number of slides uh, in a presentation or a non-confidential deck? Um, you know, how, how should that vary for a, a 10 to 12 minute podium talk versus um, a, a 30 minute one-on-one -on -one meeting versus a send away deck? I mean, th this question always comes up of you know, how long is too long, how short is too short? What is the right number of slides for these typical situations? So guys, I, I hope you don't mind uh, Perhaps I jump right in because uh, actually making slides is probably 90% of what I do. Crafting that very critical message. I probably say that uh, for an exact summary, there has to be no more than like, you know, one page maximum. You cover the market growth. You cover what is the shortfall in the market. You cover the status of the company. I mean, the status of the development. How long does it take? How much does it cost? After that, you say, who are your competitors and how much funding you need. That would be like a five-minute pitch, no more than one page. And then after that, there is 30 pages for the presentation, essentially building out on those six you know, silos I had mentioned. And, but most companies don't know that on a tip, the number of slides is not what really counts. It's actually the information that they put on each slide. There should be no more than three solid points on each slide. More than that, the brain kinds of check out. What I normally see is a lot of dense text on a page, and you get the presenter to the point where he or she is speaking almost like an auctioneer, trying to read it line for line. And that is a losing proposition. Every slide should have no more than three main points, and it moves on to the next slide. But uh, for, 30, for a 30 minute uh, presentation, I'd probably say 35 slides is sufficient. Yeah, I think I, I, that, that those are all very good points from Tony. I would also just add as a rule of thumb that a sl about a slide per minute of presentation time is, I think, a good guideline. So it it's corresponds, I think, with what Tony had said. But if you're doing that, that 10 to 12 minute very short pitch, probably 10 to 12 slides is about right. Um, for the longer presentation, you know, the 20 to 30 minute podium presentation, 
I think that 20 to 30 or, or 25 to 35 slides is about right. And I would say the same is true even of when you get a, an hour for a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a potential investor because inevitably if the meeting is going well, it's interactive, the investor is asking questions, um, is going back and forth, there's a, there's a back and forth and so that really the amount of actual presentation time, if you will, um, is probably about half of that hour. So again, that, that roughly 30 slides um, probably ends up working well, especially for those introductory meetings. So, so David, Joe, what, what, about, what about you guys? What, what makes you fall asleep? What makes you sit up and, and, and take notice? What, what are your views on this? Well, I think the best presentations are ones that are as brief as possible. And, so, and you know, if you imagine you organize it as a, a very brief slide deck that gets across the major points and then has backup slides that you can dive into if there are questions about the science or something um, so that, um, you know, uh, ideally the investor has already received the slide deck in advance, has had some chance to look at it, um, and perhaps judged on the basis of that slide deck whether or not they want to take the meeting. Um, but uh, that allows you to have a very high level of conversation and then to focus on the areas that the investor wants to dive into as opposed to a you know, much more dense deck where you might be doing a deep dive on something that the investor already knows all about and doesn't really care about and you're putting him to sleep. Um, so just try to organize it uh, so that uh, if you were going through the, you know, if you have an hour meeting, uh, if you're organized so that you could go through the highlights, uh, if you had no questions in about 15 minutes, but have the backup slides ready uh, for the inevitable questions that the investor is going to ask so that you can go into the detail where the investor wants to as needed. Yeah, I don't really have much to add. I was actually about to say the same thing, that it's fantastic when companies have um, either appendix slides or backup decks um, that, that I can dive into. Um, you know, it's, it's really easy to, to lose someone's attention if the conversation ends at, oh, we don't, you know, we can't talk about that right now. Um, let's, you know, perhaps we'll follow up at a, at a later point in time. People get busy, people stop thinking about that particular topic, and, uh, and you know, the momentum of the conversation sometimes just gets lost. So I absolutely agree, having, having backup slides uh, to dive into is, um, is incredibly helpful. And there's, there always seems to be this question about the, the division of slides. How many on, on the therapeutic area? Um, how many on the science? How many on the business and financials? How many on you know information like epi and, and and the market and prevalence and so forth? How many on uh, stuff like what what have been the recent uh, exits such as IPOs and, and M and A's in the market? Uh, you, you know which of those slides can you can you do without? I mean, do you, do you really want someone presenting the the market share and and, and epi on a disease or or do you know about that and that's just just a waste of your time? Should they start with the science? Should they start with the financials and the business plan? What's where should they focus, and what's the division of of how it goes? Well, I think those things that you've outlined are all essential slides, but I think each one of those is a single slide. Um, and if the investor wants to dive into it, you know, you have maybe two or three slides of backup that you can jump to. Um, but in a lot of presentations, you know, the epidemiology of the disease, um, you kind of put it up there um, and. You know, the, the investor may very well say, oh, you know, we're very p familiar with uh, the congestive heart failure market or whatever it is, and you just skip that slide so you can go through it very quickly. But, um, you know, if there is an interesting point there that, um, you know, may not be obvious and may not already be known to the investors, it's nice to have that slide and, and highlight it. Um, but it is something that I don't think you should leave out. I mean, that's sort of a box that the investor wants to check of, you know, are these guys at least aware of how big the market is? Yeah, I think you know one thing I would add is uh, on the. It, it's one thing to talk about the market opportunity and the market size and and the epidemiology for that matter, but one thing that you mentioned about recent exits and IPOs and comparable valuations, I'd be I'd be curious to hear David and Joe's take. But our general advice is to leave that kind of thing out of investor presentations. I think that it's really you want to be presenting your company um, and at some. Point Point the, the, the investors are going to make their own assessment for for what some of the comps might be or 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 what the what the valuation uh, what their idea of what the valuation could or should be 
Um, but sometimes when, they, when you see a list of, of other IPOs and a range of valuations from something you know, that's on a lower end to some very high, truly aspirational numbers, it, it, I think it can come across as being totally promotional. Um, and so we, we generally advise leaving that sort of thing out of presentations. Uh, I, I, would I guess I would definitely agree. disagree oh. on that. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> like we can have an argument about this. Um, I think you do need a, you know, one slide that, that has that, and I think, um, you know, sometimes it's totally useless because, and, and it can sort of indicate to the investor how sophisticated the, uh, the group is that's pitching to him. If it's uh, a bunch of comparables that, um, you know, really are relevant and where, um, you know, you want to draw the investor's attention to the fact that we look, you know, you might not think of these guys, but in fact we look a lot like them and, you know, they sold to Merck for X in, you know, three years ago. I think that's helpful. If it's, uh, you know, if the comparables are, well, you know, we're going to be Novartis in five years and Novartis is worth X billion dollars, then obviously that's pointless. But I think it is, you know, one of those slides that is a box that you should have to check in the overall presentation. You may not spend any time on it, but I think it should be there. I, I guess I you know, respectfully um, dis disagree um, that it should be a slide. It's um, there are certainly comps that a lot of companies um, can can speak to that is useful to to think about you know the company in a certain way. I think that can be done on the science slide or the market slide. You can say we're in this market, and by the way, this other company in this exact same market with this exact same target was sold for X number of dollars. That's that's fine to speak to, but in my experience, a company usually doesn't have more than two or maybe three at the maximum real comps. And if there's a list of 10 companies that you're comping yourself to on a slide, that just kind of opens yourself up to to criticism, either silently or loud, as to why you're not really like these companies. And, and I kind of agree with Adam. It, to me personally, it comes off as overly, overly promotional when there's just a list of comps on a slide that, that you know, you, you're making an argument that you're undervalued um, relative to those guys. I mean, one nuance, by the way, is which this can sometimes be a uh, Roundabout way to address comps is to is to um, proactively address the competitive landscape um, and looking at other companies that are either have products on the market or in development for the same indication or pursuing a similar target class or or um, or have a, a, a similar um, scientific approach and obviously you then want to be able to answer how how you're different from those um, without uh, trashing. Uh, the competition, but you know that that's that can also be a roundabout way to present some comps. And by the way, like so, you know, David is clearly more of an expert than I am. Certainly in the private markets, I, I generally look at the at the public markets. And so, uh, to David's point, you know, comps I could see comps being more useful in the private markets where it's not as obvious what all the different players are. Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll give my thoughts on this. Okay, so I think that. Because this is bio, and most of the products tend to be much more sophisticated, requires a deeper knowledge of the science. So, and the the, the end consumer, the investors, are probably more the profile of David and and Joe than you know the private uh, investors I talk to uh, for a smaller company, for example, raising between two to ten million at a twenty million dollar valuation. And the guy who's sitting across the table is an owner of a, a you know a Home Depot, a very wealthy individual, but who really doesn't have any background in healthcare. It is extremely important to have those comparables, you know, uh, those uh, comparisons to private deals or else you know public valuations, because you, you guys got to remember here that Adam, David, Joe, you know, everybody are you guys are capable of providing your own uh, comparables. But let's just say that you're pitching to a you know a non-specialist audience. Uh, that slide that provides the comps is the key for these small private companies to be able to get two million dollars from a guy who owns you know a Home Depot around the corner. So a lot of a lot of different thoughts on on the subject of comps in in particular. Um, before um, moving on to something uh, non-number of slide related. 
Um, I, I think David, you had mentioned that there should be, you know, one slide on the science, one slide on the financials, and and backup slides um, to support that. And a lot of decks I see there's there's certainly more than than one slide. Um, you know, what's what's your take on that? Is is um, you know should should the science slides go first, and how many should there be? If not, just just one and the, the appendices. Uh, should the financial slides go first? Should the management slide go first? What is the first thing you want to hit the, the VC with? Um, well, so first, uh, correction. So I think, you know, the things that I was talking about being a single slide are things like the summary financials, what the IP position is, um, you know, what the market comps are, who the competitors are, and so forth. I think those can all be handled in one slide. The science. Uh, if you're pitching a biotech company, uh, is, is definitely going to require more than one slide. And so that's where I think you want to be really thoughtful about how much detail do we want to present, how much time do we have, and how much do we want to put in the sort of summary presentation versus in the backup slides. But that's definitely going to be several slides. Um, I, you know, I think the standard format for a pitch is um, start out with, uh, you know, title slide, um, maybe some brief introduction to what is the area that we're addressing, um, and then you should cover the team because the team is probably the people who are sitting in the room, and that gives everybody a chance to introduce themselves, talk about their background, and so forth, um, and then generally jump into the meat of it, which is the, the science presentation, what the value proposition is, and then have uh, all of those other one-slide pieces that I'm talking about uh, at the end so that you can uh, check the box on, you know, have we thought about the IP, what is the IP position, what are the likely exit comparables, what are the financials? If you're a startup company, you know that's generally one slide because there really isn't very much to say about it. Um, and I think, um, you know, if you're projecting ten years out in the future, we're going to have this on the market. We're going to have sales of X, Y, Z. The investors really aren't going to pay much attention to that anyway. So um, if you have too much, if you have more than one slide, I think it's probably unrealistic for an early stage uh, biotech company. So um, one of the I think there's a couple of themes there. Go on, Adam. Oh, I was just going to say there are a couple of themes that, that um, probably play into some of the other topics we discussed and and are, are are key for these presentations in general. But one is the the companies need to keep in mind that they're telling a story, and the other one is knowing your audience. So it goes to something Tony said before. If you're if you're presenting to a non-scientific, non-biotech savvy person, you, you can't get too deep into the science or you'll lose them and you want to make sure that there's a clear story told about what you're addressing and, and making sure that you explain the disease in, in as simple terms as possible and understanding the market opportunity. If you're dealing with more savvy life sciences investors like David and Joe, you know, they're not going to be, I assume this is okay in speaking for you, that you're not going to be satisfied with just sort of the basic overview on the science. You're going to want to dive in much deeper. Um, and in terms of the telling the story part, you know, I think most presentations, and this, this um, goes along with what David said, you know, it does have an introduction. You know, generally, uh, I think slide presentations are good after the title slide to start out with the quick highlights, you know, it's really what the outline would be of the of the elevator pitch of of who you are, what you have, what you're doing, and where you're going next, sort of thing. Um, and then the you know the, the the slides that come after that are the detail to back to back that up and and to and to give some more background. Um, you know, that being said, the recipe isn't always exactly the same for every company. It's obviously going to be different when you're going after diseases that are very well known, there doesn't need to be as much background on those particular diseases. Um, when, you, when you already have clinical data, it's not as necessary to, to spend a lot of time on, on, on preclinical information. But, um, but I think those are at least a couple of themes to keep in mind. So one of the things that, uh, you know, the, the, slides are, the slides are great, but they assume that you, you actually secured the meeting to present those slides in the first place. Um, at a conference like Bioinvestor Forum or Bio International Convention, uh, you have partnering meetings where uh, you know the, the whole point of it is our companies can do their presentations and they can have 30-minute private meetings with investors. Um, what is the best thing in one of these meeting requests that will get the attention of the investor? Is it just um, you know, one one sentence that says, "I got a small molecule mTOR against breast cancer. Uh, let's meet." Or, you know, how how descriptive 
is it? In, in the partnering system, we see things uh, anywhere from hi, let's meet and, and nothing else to uh, a very detailed description of the, the molecule and the opportunity. Um, if we step back from the slide and just look at the partnering meeting request, whether it's, it's at a partnering meeting or whether it comes to you through snail mail as a brochure or, uh, or e an email, um, what is it that gets your attention to secure that meeting in the first place? Well, you're asking about different contexts. So first of all, I would tell everybody, don't ever send anything by snail mail. It goes straight into the garbage. Nobody ever looks at anything that they receive by snail mail these days. Uh, for the, your request for a meeting at the Bioinvestor Forum, uh, I would err on the side of your shortest example of, you know, we have an mTOR inhibitor for whatever. Um, because uh, realize that the investors that you're pitching to are receiving a lot of these, and so they're going to need to quickly, you know, they're probably going to make a flash judgment on whether they want to see you or not. If, and if you have, uh, if your request has multiple paragraphs describing your company, I can pretty much guarantee you it's not going to get read. So um, even if you have a longer one, uh, make sure you summarize in the very first sentence what the key point is that you're trying to get across to see whether the investor is interested or not. Um, remember, at the end of the day, you're trying to get investors uh, who are a fit for you. You don't want to just get any investor, and um, you know if they're not going to invest in your company, you're wasting everybody's time. So, if, if you, to the extent that you can summarize what you're up to, so that uh, both sides can decide quickly whether it makes sense to have a meeting, that's the, the best way to handle it. Um, I, I guess, like the. The most effective ones for me, um, unless you're a totally new kid on the block, is if you have some recent piece of news flow, like you just got phase one data showing XYZ on our molecule, and our molecule is an mTOR inhibitor. That um, that will generally catch my attention if you know the news is substantial, and and I will I will generally take a meeting, um, you know, if that news is substantial. Cool. So. Uh, if if we jump into uh, some of the other things that you know, investors might look for, uh, one thing I get a lot is um, how much do investors expect that the um, that the the owners or the management team have invested in their own startup? Any thoughts on that? Well, so you're talking about a, a early stage company that's looking for venture funding, right? Um, yes. You know, it, it's investors always like to see the founders having skin in the game, um, but I think investors are also cognizant that not everybody has a lot of money to invest, and so that for one founder, having put five thousand dollars into a company may be a huge amount of money to that founder, and for another founder, having put twenty million dollars into the company may be peanuts to him, and it may not be as meaningful as that other investor's five thousand. Um, so. You know, I think investors are basically looking for real commitment um, in the company, and the, and the amount of money that's invested is is just one of several measures of that. Rick, David, does sweat equity play a big role there? I would imagine. Sure. Um, you know, if somebody is devoted, uh, you know, has quit their job and has spent the last six months working for free to try to put this thing together, that may be a lot more meaningful than having invested two million dollars in it. Yeah, may, maybe I, I switched hats for a little bit, you know, and go back to the days when I was uh, an institutional investor myself. When I look at these companies, I would try not to, you know, try not to hone in on that subject that makes them really, really comfortable, because uncomfortable, because you know, asking them how much they have contributed financially directly into the company, which they are now asking you to do 10x that or even 100x that. I would focus on what kind of contribution does this person in front of me now, the CEO, the CSO, the founder, is going to contribute to get to the end zone. Like, do they know what to do to get to the market? More so than how much money they have actually put in. Because uh, you know, I was sitting on, on billions of dollars of capital, so getting them the funding is not the deal. Uh, it's, it's not a problem for me, or how much they put into the company is not a problem for me. I just wanted to know whether or not they are capable of getting this thing to the end zone, which they are promising me they would do. That's more important. 
but that, that's only from the, my perspective as a former you know, institutional investor. And, and speaking of money, and, and uh, David, I, I, I'm sorry I misrepresented what you said before. Ho hopefully I don't do it again. Um, but I think at, at the beginning you said one of the things you're trying to figure out is how much capital are you trying to raise. And one of the questions that I get a lot is, should I just explicitly mention how much I'm trying to raise? Um, you know, what do you think about that? Is, is it better if someone just says up front, I'm looking to raise X million dollars, or is that something that's uh, usually the, the investor is going to going to help determine? No, I think absolutely they should say up front how much money they're trying to raise. Um, and if you don't know how much money you're trying to raise, you shouldn't be talking to investors yet. You should uh, have a plan and you should be, I mean, the investors may very well come back with their own opinions about it, but you should definitely walk in with an opinion of how much money you need, what you're going to do with it, and why that's going to create value for the investor. So. Let's 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 um, you know equate this maybe to a, a, a dating a little bit and and how aggressive you should be. Um, so you 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 have this meeting with with an investor and you, you think it went kind of well. You know, just like you, you you had the first date with a girl and you think it went kind of well. How, how does the follow up process work or, or how should it work? Who is supposed to call whom? Um, you know should should a biotech be aggressive in following up with with the investor or or should the, the biotech wait for a call for, for the investor um, you know, it, to see how aggressive the biotech is? Um, you know, everyone, everyone is always wondering these in, in all sorts of facets of life, but for, for this session, uh, biotech investment. Well, I have a, an answer to that, but if anybody else wants to go first, please go ahead. I mean, I, I would. My personal opinion is that you should. First of all, you should end every meeting with, with, uh, with the request of what are next steps, um, so that you get a sense. You know, certain funds have have a certain process that they want to go through before you reach out to them again. Others, you know, will tell you that they want to be kept up on where you are in the process with financing or to follow up with us again in a week or whatever it may be. So, so setting the stage in that way is is one thing. You know, I think in, also in, in many cases in meetings, if there's interest from the investor, they've, they've asked about some details, whether it's about some papers or publications um, on, on some of your uh, programs or on some of the science that you can send as a follow-up. Um, and I, I wouldn't wait to do that. I think, you know, the idea is to try to do that as soon as possible to show that you're being responsive. Um, but that, that's at least, you know, what we generally advise. But... Obviously, what's more important is what, what the investors on the panel have to say. So uh, one piece of advice I give more frequently than any other to people in all kinds of situations is never be scared to be a pest. Um, every, uh, I think that uh, everybody has this sense that if you're pestering somebody in a business setting that they're just going to think you're annoying and it's going to damage your prospects of getting anywhere with them. And I think exactly the opposite is true. Um, I think uh, certainly in the venture capital world, uh, everybody is uh, looking at more things than they can possibly follow up on. Everybody's got lots of balls in the air. Everybody is busy. Um, and it is entirely possible for uh, a company who the VCs are honestly interested in to fall through the cracks because the VCs aren't, aren't really sure about what the next step is or which one of them is supposed to follow up on it or the meeting was last week and they've seen six other companies since then and they've just forgotten about that one. Um, and so the fact is if you're not a pest, you're probably not going to get anywhere. And uh, certainly in the context of pitching to VCs, um, you know, what's the VC going to think of you if you are a pest? They're going to think, wow, this is somebody who's really driven, really persistent, and that's the kind of person I'm going to want to back. Um, so my advice is uh, basically don't be rude, but uh, if you're not getting anywhere, pester the hell out of them. Um, and if the answer is going to be no, it's not going to be no because you're being a pest. It's going to be no for whatever other perfectly good or not good reason the VC is going to pass on you anyway. And everybody's better off if you can flesh that out sooner rather than later. So, um, you know, I agree with Adam's point. You should certainly end the pitch meeting with a discussion about, okay, well, what are the next steps and get this other information 
follow up with uh, immediately with uh, your next steps, if that's opening a data room or sending, emailing some papers or something. Um, but just keep saying, you know, okay, well, what is the next step? When should I follow up with you? And just keep following up because the fact is the more you're on their radar screen, um, the guiltier they're going to feel about not getting back to you and the quicker you're going to get to a resolution of, it, you know, where is this going? Is this, you know, is there serious interest or isn't there? Yeah, I would agree with everything that's been said. Um, I, I think I do think the best way to follow up is um, to send to send some sort of additional information, even if there wasn't um, a question that you know you couldn't answer that you had to follow up on. Generally, there's I mean there's no way you could have included everything that's interesting about your company in that short slide deck. So whatever the investor was interested in, I I always appreciate when companies send me um, additional information on on whatever I was interested in, and um, that you know, gets me looking at the company again. Uh, generally, unless I'm totally slammed, I'll generally open the attachment and spend some time on it. And um, that, that has been an effective way in the past of, of piquing my interest in following up with the company. And David, you... And realize if, well, so, you know, often the VC's next step is going to be, you know, they're going to talk about you after you leave the room. They're going to say, oh, well, you know, why don't we run this by Joe Schmuglotsky, you know, who we've worked with on something else before and see what he thinks of it. So they're going to email your slide deck to this guy. And so then, you know, every, you don't realize it, but uh, the ball is in this other guy's court, and he may not have ever even opened the email. And so if you call up the VC or send them an email, that may trigger another email to Joe saying, you know, hey, Joe, we sent you this thing last week. We'd really like to know what you thought about it, and then we'll keep things moving. So, um, you know, again, I see virtually no downside to being a pest and uh, a lot of upside to it. Yeah, perhaps I can offer something, you know, um, a little bit more practical for you, for the companies especially, to think about this, right? So let's just say that we meet in two years from now. I guarantee you, Adam, David, Joe, and Sugato, no one is going to remember why we met this day, right? But the human, because of we've been tweaked by millions of years of biology, we can always remember the person that we saw. We are tweaked. We are hardwired for that, okay? And I know that, you know, because I sit next to all these private companies, and try to find a way how to make them stand out. We've had great success in doing just this. Make a small PDF with the, your month. If you were the person talking to the VC at that meeting, for all, for all you know, when you send something to him, you are mTOR A, mTOR B, mTOR C, mTOR D. They actually don't know, don't care, can't remember. But because you sat in front of them, they will remember your month. So if I were to send something to the investor, this is what I do. I put my face on it because they met me. I put a little bit about the technology, and then there is a corporate slide deck and say that during our conversation, you were interested in this particular aspect of our company. And on slide 28, you can find that. If I can be a further assistance to you, let me know. But certainly, without having your mug on the email, you are just mTOR A or mTOR B or mTOR C. They totally don't remember. And since we are humans and we're tweaked to remember faces, I think it, the companies would have a much higher success by doing exactly what I just, uh, you know, have done for my other companies. I'd like to hear what the other panelists think. Right. Well, well, well thanks. So I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. You're saying put a but, put your photograph in. Email? Yeah, yeah. Me, meaning send 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 out a small one page with the fo your photograph of the person who has spoken to the PC. Next to it is a small paragraph that describing the company. You don't have to fill up the whole page. But more importantly, they, the person, you know, David or Joe, who sits back and receives follow-up emails from the company, they see the person's face. They will remember that. And then after that, they work from the face onto the technology and back to the, where the conversation was. If not, it's just a bunch of text. People just plush it over. Well, I guess I have to respectfully disagree with you. I think I've never received an email like that, <laughs> and I think it would come across as a little bizarre. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, if the if the investor is interested, uh, they are going to remember that this was the company that's doing X, and um, they're going to remember, you know, especially, you know, you shouldn't be following up 
three months later, you should be following up uh, the following week at the very latest, and it should be reasonably fresh in their mind of, oh yeah, we saw those guys, and they're the, they're the ones who are doing this. Um, so, you know, I think you may be right, and I think in, in terms of, you know, jogging people's memory by faces, but I think to the extent that that's sort of, you know, over time that's kind of getting built in to everything that we do on the computers, but I think if you make a point of attaching the photograph of yourself in a prominent way, I think that would just come across as a, as a bit weird uh, today. No, it'd be a tiny little passport picture next to the paragraph of the technology that, you know, the investor and, and the company has spoken about during the meeting. Well, let's let's move on to something that's slightly different or, or perhaps entirely different. Um, that, that's the CVC, the Corporate Venture Capital. Uh, you know, we, of course, there are probably about 30 corporate venture capital arms out there. And three or four years ago, uh, when money was tighter, um, it, was, it seemed to be almost a must that in order to have VCs interested in you, you needed CVCs to, to be interested in you, and it, and it was always going to be a joint proposition. Uh, are VCs uh, still looking as much that you have to have CVC interest? Um, should you, you know, if you have something, should you try to pitch to VCs first, or should you try to pitch to corporate venture capital first? What, what's, your, what's your take on that? Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I don't see any downside to pitching to both, and you should pitch to both. Um, why would it hurt you to pitch to both? And are you, are you looking for, you know, does, does that make a significant difference in your, your willingness to, to be involved if, if they have um, you know, a, a CVC involved in round B financing already? I, from my perspective, um, having another uh, intelligent investor who I respect um, involved is generally a plus, um, whether that be a corporate investor or another venture investor. Um, I think uh, the trick with uh, corporate venture funds is um, there are lots of different ways that they're structured. There are lots of different incentives. Um, sometimes they come, you know, their investment comes along with strings on the company options and all that sort of thing that you need to be uh, cognizant about as you think about evaluating the potential for return from to the non-corporate venture investors. Um, but I think there are a lot of uh, very smart uh, corporate venture investors who I'd be happy to invest alongside. So one other uh, question. I think a question Sorry. maybe more relevant to the private. Or the, the, I, I don't have a lot to add. I guess I, that question might be more relevant to the private markets than the public markets. Um, personally, I the difference between corporate VC and VC to means to me means very little as a as a public markets investor evaluating IPO, for example. Okay. So uh, an, another question that. Um, I, I guess the, the unspoken question is, these days, do you have to be a rare disease company to get funding? Um, a, a lot of VC dollars, uh, investment dollars, have uh, maybe disproportionately gone to rare disease companies lately. Um, it, you know, if, if someone has the, the next uh, cholesterol drug or something, uh, how is that going to uh, measure up against someone who, who's going to solve Gosher disease or, or, or something like that? Uh, do non-rare disease companies uh, have have as much of a chance as, as they used to? I mean, my, my joking response would be that you don't have to be a rare disease company. You could be an immuno-oncology company. Um, but, but I think it's not just those two areas. Um, you know, I, I think it's really about whether you have a compelling story uh, generally. Um, but I, I do think, you know, we have seen a lot of, um, investors in small biotech companies, whether they're private or public, um, shy away in many cases from indications that require very long, very large development, um, you know, very large trials that take a very long time that then on the back end of that still need a very large sales and marketing effort um, because you're, you're adding another level of um, another variable, which isn't just the usual uh, risk in terms of of, 
of scientific and clinical and execution and regulatory risk, but then you know, you're dependent on a much larger company in the form of a partner or acquirer on the other end of that to actually sell the drug. And so, you know, that that's one area that we've seen a number of investors, um, you know, draw a line, if you will, around indications. So I think you have to put yourself in the mind of the investor, which all goes back to uh, how much money do I need to put in? What are the milestones that I'm going to achieve with that? How long is it going to take? And what is the exit going to look like? Uh, so if you're talking about a drug to lower cholesterol, um, you know, the problem is that there are lots of drugs that lower cholesterol. The um, clinical trials to show that you're better than other drugs that lower cholesterol are astronomical in size, um, and you, at the end of the day, you'd be up against a lot of generic drugs. Uh, and so all of that calculus is going to steer investors away from that, whereas with a rare disease, uh, often you're looking at something where um, you know the, it's a completely unmet clinical need. Um, the trials to demonstrate that the drug actually works are fairly brief. You get orphan drug protection, all that sort of thing. Um, so that tends to make those look more attractive. But it's, um, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's a more complicated question than just you know what's hot is is are rare diseases hot? Well, yes, they are. But the reason that they're hot is because the investors are going through that mental calculus of how much money in, how much time, how much risk, and what does the exit look like? And uh, and uh, uh, related to that, um, assuming a company is not working on a novel therapeutic, uh, what is the best way to address competition? Uh, or, or should management avoid that topic when, when making an investor pit? So if, if it looks like you're going to, if um, it's, a, it's a me too, um, and there's certainly a lot of those out there, um, you know, how, how do you make that pitch? I, mean, I probably think don't want to pitch yourself as a me too. <laughs> I think management should right, de yeah. definitely address the definitely address the competition um, and make a very clear case about why you're differentiated from from others. Um, you know, in my personal opinion, I think it's hard to answer that question without getting a lot more specific about what the it is that you're talking about. Because if you're just a me too in a crowded market that probably doesn't make a lot of sense and so there's probably some angle about it that has you as the entrepreneur excited about it and so you need to be able to articulate that to why that makes sense to the, the venture investor. And uh, another question that, that came in um, and I'm, I'm starting to go to some of the, the Q&A's that, that, that have been coming in although I've been doing that regularly throughout. Um, when, when prospective cash flows are speculative, how do you establish a relevant discount factor in various fields, for example, pharma or, or device? So as a VC, if it's an early stage company, um, the, the discount factor is, is generally just outright disbelief of uh, what those projections are, and I would probably want to make my own projections from scratch. Uh, in medical device companies, um, it often is possible to build much more meaningful financial models of what the pricing would be, what the penetration would be, what the timing would be, but for drug companies, you know, if you're an early stage drug company, by the time you actually get to market, the landscape is going to ch have changed pretty dramatically. Um, and so that really winds up, you know, in the minds of the VC being just sort of, is, is this something that is bigger than a $200 million drug? Is this potentially a billion dollar drug? And you don't pay a lot of attention to the sales forecasts, you know, 15 years out from now. But it, I, I think it's a mistake to think that we uh, take those numbers and plug them into an Excel spreadsheet and apply a discount rate and sort of ask the question of, well, what discount rate are you using and how do you come up with it? Because, you know, unless it's a medical device or something that is very close to the market and you have some real visibility on what those numbers could look like, um, that's a pointless exercise and I don't know any VCs who actually do that. Great advice, great perspectives. So not, another question that came in from our audience is, is the big issue for a new biotech is to get funds without an advanced proof of concept. Uh, the usual reply is to come back when your proof of concept will be performed. How do you deal with this vicious circle? 
the question is, what is the proof of concept? Um, so if the proof of concept is we want to see a clinical trial with a P of less than 0.05 demonstrating XYZ, um, that obviously is very difficult for a small company to generate. If the proof of concept is uh, run some mice and show us that it works in this mouse model, um, you know, that's usually something that you could potentially fund by scraping together some money among friends and family and, and angel investors. Um, and that's probably an exercise worth doing if it's um, something that you really believe is going to work. So one one so question I, that's I guess I can't speak for the investors that ask or I, I guess I can't speak for the investors that want clinical proof of concept that you know there's that phenotype of investor. I, I can say that we certainly um, invest at earlier stages on a regular basis than than clinical quote unquote proof of concept. Um, if the so, the science is solid and um, the people are solid, um, we believe that you know the data will be what it will be, but great people and great science will find a way to make it work at the end. And what are, what are your thoughts on on foreign companies? So what what would be your your tips and advice for EU companies, let's say, pitching to U.S. investors? Um, is is there any differences in the way you think about uh, European companies, or the way European companies should go go about pitching to U.S. investors? I think um, you know. A lot of it depends on the stage of the company and so forth. Um, if you're a company looking to raise a venture round um, and you're in Europe, um, obviously the U.S. investors are going to be wondering, well, you know, why aren't the European investors funding you? Um, investors, VCs in the U.S. are going to be thinking about attending board meetings and what a hassle that's going to be to fly all the way to Europe to or be on phone calls at 2 in the morning to attend board meetings. Um, so I think anytime you go out of your home geography, you need to realize that the bar is probably going to be a lot higher, um, especially if you want an, an active investor. For later stage companies or for public companies, um, you know, a lot of that goes away. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, any company that's going public on the NASDAQ or you know any exchange rate is going to be talking to international investors as well. But for early stage companies, um, you know, if, if you can't get at least one of your local VCs interested in what you're doing, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to try to shop it internationally. Any other perspectives on the, on the foreign? Have... Go ahead, Adam. Yeah, I was just going to add a couple things to what David said, which is um, you know, that I think a lot of U.S. investors, and maybe this is more true on the public side, as David kind of alluded to, but, you know, what they're looking for in, in companies generally is the same, but there, isn't, there is a, a certain need for access and access to and visibility of management. So if you're a European company and you're planning on coming to the States once a year, that's, that's probably not going to satisfy most active investors in the U.S., um, and then one other consideration is that sometimes European companies are very, uh, you know, European centric. Um, and given that the United States is still the, the single largest market for drugs, um, a lot of times U.S. investors want to know that you you have a plan and a strategy, and you have the the knowledge and expertise in house to be able to develop something that could eventually get FDA approval if the U.S. is a relevant market. Yeah, I, I personally tell all of my guys who are European to go and get a New York office if they're planning to do a raise in the U.S. U.S. investors want to see a U.S. office, even though if the you know the U.S. office is purely cosmetic, it's still a little bit in in them that they want to see something local, especially if you're running around doing boat shows in New York and San Francisco. Well, I would like to uh, sincerely thank our panelists. We are out of time, even though uh, we have we have a lot more questions we could we could go over. Um, uh, this has been uh, a great and hopefully very informative session. Uh, we encourage uh, you to come to Bio Investor Forum in San Francisco in uh, on October seventh and eighth to have a rare and unique opportunities to have private thirty minute 
partnering meetings with uh, a number of really uh, great venture capitalists, corporate venture capitalists, patient advocacy groups, um, angel investors, and the like. Uh, so we, we hope to see you there. And uh, David, uh, Joe, Adam, and Tony, I would like to thank you for um, really providing a great panel and great insights uh, to us today. What we will be doing is taking some of the questions that we did not get to and posing them offline to our panelists. Uh, and they, if they have the, the bandwidth, might be able to answer one or two. And then we'll post those answers to our Biotech Now blog. Uh, so look there uh, for potentially more answers from our panelists. Uh, so again, I'd like to thank our panel um, and thank the audience for attending. And we wish you happy hunting as far as uh, achieving your investment goals. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.